Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Krishna C. Nadella, and this is State of Mind. Continuing on our Welcome to the Real World series, today's topic is entitled Redevelopment of Career Development. On our prior series, Older But Wiser, we spoke about the concept of the quarter life crisis, a period of life usually ranging from the 20s to the early 30s, in which a person begins to feel doubtful about their own lives brought on by the stress of becoming an adult. One of the ways one can counteract this stress is by taking ownership of their career and developing as a professional to differentiate oneself within the workforce. With that said, career development, like one's own resume, is an ever-evolving and ever-changing idea, and the measures that are made to make one successful in the years past are not necessarily guaranteed to provide the results in the future. As such, it is important to constantly take inventory of one's career and be willing to redevelop their career development. Back with us to help provide some insight on the topic are the following guests. Annie Wiseman from the Institute for Family Health, John Colburn from the Aspen Institute, and Rishi Chopra from the Wadwani Foundation. Annie, John, Rishi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank Great to be here. John, I'd like to start with you. Another open-ended question, but what would state of mind be without open-ended questions? Yep. To kick off, what does career development mean to you? So, you know, I think, uh, I think there is this expectation, um, particularly for f folks that are in college, there's, a, there's this thing called a career development office. People probably go there. There's a copy of the What Color Is My Parachute book. Uh, <laughs> there's maybe a couple of assessment tests that you can sort of take, uh, find out your Myers-Briggs. Uh, and then maybe uh, there's, a, there's a couple of internships uh, to, to, to explore particular careers. And really, I think the purpose of a career development office is to provide a structured way for somebody to think about uh, what kind of career is going to offer, what kind of jobs or occupation is going to provide uh, reward, is going to recognize the innate skills that you might have or the interests that you might have, uh, and give you the networks then to be able to explore that, whether that's through informational interviews with alumni or with that's uh, 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 doing some job shadowing with somebody or taking on an internship. And I think it's a really helpful and important part of a younger person trying to explore the world and look at what's out there. Uh, uh, sometimes I think uh, we operate on automatic pilot, that some expectation was made for us early in our, in our, in our lives, and we try to sort of operate on that. But a, a good career development process really gives you the opportunity to explore a couple of different possibilities, test out some of those assumptions, and see uh, what, what it takes to move from an interest level to actually engaging in that occupation or career. Annie, do we do enough career development? And is that something we probably don't think too much about when we're 17, 18, 19 years yeah, old? Yeah, and I, I think, we, I think <coughs> we do a lot focused on um, what job am I going to have or what degree am I going to get? And we think about that as our career. But I think what we could do a better job of is looking at um, who am I as a person and where does that, where do I fit within the working world? You know, should I work for a big organization or a small one? Um, should I work in a place that's fast paced or more kind of relaxed and casual? Um, and so thinking about those things in terms of career development so that you're, um, you're not just thinking that you want to work for a specific organization because it's got a, a great brand or a, a great name. Um, or uh, you know, geographically you want to work in a certain place, but thinking about how your career, how your job um, is, is going to fit in with the rest of your life. So I think we could do more of that, especially for uh, people. I think we also sort of end the career development when you come out of college and all of a sudden, you know, within six months, your alumni status, you, know, you can use the, the resources on campus, but that goes, starts to go away. And so that career development office isn't always open to you when you're a year out of school or a couple of years out of school. So I think we could do a better job of continuing to pay mm -hmm. attention and develop um, for those, especially those first few years out of, out of college. One of the things we hear about Rishi when people graduate is own your career. We tell this to students upon you know, graduation at commencement. What does that mean? What does owning one's career really mean? So I think when you're younger and when you graduate college for the first time, I think it is important to have a level of structure and organization in place. Um, because I think you know our maturity level is a bit different when we're younger, right? So we need some extra guidance from our counselors, from our instructors. And we might need like a step-by-step -step roadmap in our 20s, and, and which would tell us that you know, this is what you need to do uh, to get this job, to get there. You need to get this degree. You need to take this exam. You need to fulfill all those requirements, which, which is very important like in your 20s, right? So I think initially, career development means you do need structure and organization in your life. You do need to follow kind of a certain path that's laid out for you. And, and you should, um, you know, um, confer with adults and your counselors and, or whatnot, whatever's available to you in high school. 
Later on, however, I feel career development changes because I think we change as people in life, right? Um, it kind of reminds me of these community service projects I used to do in high school and college. And I always used to wonder, why do I have to do this? I can't, you know. You know, and there's a certain aspects of it that I liked and certain aspects of it I, I thought, well, I just can't wait till this is over. You know, because when you're a teenager, there's a million other things on your mind. But now, looking back, um, you know, in my 30s, I kind of realized, well, I kind of now sense why they made us do these community service projects. It's because it kind of makes you realize what impact you want to make on society mm -hmm. and what impact you want to make on yourself as well. And that changes throughout life, right? It changes in your 20s, it changes in your 30s, it changes in your 40s. So I think we always have to reevaluate what we're doing in our life, what impact we want to make in our local community and the larger society, and, and what kind of reward or satisfaction that gives us internally. And that's when we have to come to the realization that our career might change. It might totally change when we're in our 30s or 40s, and that's OK. Like, we don't have to keep the same level of priorities and the same objectives we had in our 20s that we have in our 30s. So in that regard, I think career development means being open-minded and realizing that we change throughout our life, that our com communities change, societies change, and so we have to be willing to change throughout and to really get that full satisfaction as you're evolving as a person. So starting off with more structured and organized, but then allowing yourself to be a little bit more open-minded, a little bit more ex exploring other options. As the world gets more and more competitive and everyone's always trying to find a way to differentiate themselves, I'd like to elaborate on something you hit upon that it's okay if things get off the rails, if that career development, that strategy you had uh, doesn't necessarily work out the way you thought it would. The ability to fail or to pick yourself up, what are your thoughts on that? Because that's going to happen, and you can't account for that. Certainly. You know, well, well me, you know, being <coughs> raised in the San Francisco Bay Area and Silicon Valley, just the motto in Silicon Valley is that, you know, we love to fail. And the more failures you have, the more startups that you have failed under your belt, the more of a tech entrepreneur you really are. You know, so back in Silicon Valley, it's almost a culture really? that you're expected to fail. And the more you fail, the smarter you are, the more seasoned you are. Um, but that's not the case everywhere, right? Like in certain cultures, like I, I'm, I'm Indian American, so in, in more of a traditional uh, Indian culture, you know, it, you're kind of encouraged not to fail, which is understandable, right? I mean, your parents will want to see you succeed. They have good intentions. So they want you to do everything you can to prevent failure from happening, right? So it's a very, I would say it's a bit more, more risk averse in that regard. So again, like you have to kind of balance these different forces that are, uh, that are imposing upon your life, right? But at the end of the day, I think you have to realize that you have to embrace failure, uh, not look at it as a, a, as a permanent setback, but rather a temporary setback. Um, and realize that this will only make me stronger. This will only open another new door for me. Um, and the more and more you realize that, the more stronger you become, the more immune you become to layoffs, economic recessions, mm -hmm. uncertainty. Because no matter what degree we get, whether you're from Harvard, Yale, or San Jose State, whichever university you're from, you're gonna have to face that. Right. You know, it's just a reality of life. And, and I think the accelerating pace of change in the economy just means that uh, things that look like good jobs today may not may not even exist as jobs five years from now. That's a good point. Uh, and so, uh, I think it's important not to internalize failure. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, it's just circumstances. Uh, and so, nevertheless, to be able to sort of brush yourself off and figure out if, if my job's not going to be around in a year or two, how do I move on to the next? And I should say, I you know, I think if if you look out uh, at, at at higher education today, the fastest growing area of of higher education are these. Uh, uh, our credentials at the sort of sub-baccalaureate level, uh, people going back to school to pick up a skill, to pick up a credential. Uh, and I think that's really reflecting this sort of rapid pace of change as people are looking for opportunities to extend their careers or to move into new areas uh, as their existing jobs may be winding down or at least not providing the kind of opportunity they were looking for. So elaborate on that for a second. When we talk about differentiating one's career, owning their career, developing their career, um, it's not necessarily what you're doing in the workplace necessarily that ties to that. It's also some of these other things like taking additional courses, going back to school. Help me understand what type of skill sets that would be. So I, I think that's a big part of it. I think, uh, I think the other thing that, um, that people pay a lot more attention to now and there's more mechanisms to pay attention to is sort of how do you build out your networks? Uh, how do you make sure that uh, you have uh, friends, acquaintances uh, beyond maybe your immediate uh, area of work uh, that then give you the wherewithal to be able to have conversations with others uh, about uh, 
about working in other companies or about working in other careers. I think uh, to the extent that you can sort of build out networks through you know, attending meetings and mm -hmm. being parts of associations and uh, you know, uh, socializing with folks outside of work, I think that all sort of helps build uh, a kind of a, a, a base that you can use to, uh, to develop and, and, and grow your career. All right. Annie, I see you nodding. Um, one thing I've wanted to just interject is that the running joke I've always heard growing up was networking is not working. Not working, yeah. Um, <laughs> Sounds like that's very much not the case. Can you elaborate? Yeah, I, I think it's um, we view networking pretty narrowly as sort of the, you know you're um, at a cocktail hour and you're or you're having to you know sort of share business cards and so it's a lot more formal. And I think these days, and, and maybe it's just me that I've just sort of figured this out um, in the last several years, is that you know you can network through a book club, for example. So I'm in a a, um, a professional women's book club, and there are about six or eight of us that um, sort of rotate now, and we we um, sort of read a book and then come together and discuss it or you can um, have volunteer opportunities you know those those opportunities for networking and for um, in, in continuing your own education um, can come in a, in a myriad of ways it doesn't always have to sort of be a um, kind of a formal stuffy uncomfortable situation um, I know that I was always sort of um, I thought that I wasn't good at networking and I thought that it, you know because it was those situations where it seemed a little bit awkward but then what I realized is oftentimes you leave those and you walk out with someone or a group of people and that's when you're really doing your networking and you're kind of getting to know someone which is something I very much love to do yeah. um, so I think opening up your view of networking and um, and thinking of different ways to do it that are right for you uh, can be really helpful All right. um, it goes back to some of that self-awareness that we talked about in our previous episode you know the ability to think outside the box and Obviously, you want to execute in your job. You want to do well because that's going to your you know your base your performance performance on. But um, all these outside aspects, I think, really help arsenal you for uh, for much better days ahead when things aren't going so well. So let's talk to that career redevelopment. The idea that you had a strategy, you had a plan, maybe it didn't work out. Rishi, what's career redevelopment? So Krishna, this 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 reminds me of um, a class I took in in, in my undergrad years. Uh, one of my favorite professors, uh, Professor Sean Jinray, taught this class called Black Social Movements. Okay. And he, I remember this one lecture which always struck me. He's like, remember when we were a kid and the first time you rode your bike and the first time your dad let you go and took off the training wheels and you were outside of your comfort zone and you thought like, oh, this is it. I'm going to die now. I'm going to, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> But, but then you know, those next few minutes and those next few hours, you felt so empowered and so independent. You're like, wow, I can actually do this. You know? And I used to do it with my dad and with the training wheels, but now I can just do it on my own. So the reason why I brought that story up is because I think it's really important to put ourselves outside of our comfort zone right? and realize that it was my comfort zone back in the day to be in the legal profession. I was a paralegal. I was going to go that way or be in the healthcare profession. And I was a, a nurse. It was great. I loved it. But then to step outside of your comfort zone and redevelop your career means now you might explore an entirely new avenue, which was completely uncharted territory to you in the past. Like you would have never thought that like, why would I even consider doing this? But because of life's changing circumstances, now you realize, well, you know, it's time for me to step outside of my comfort zone and try out this new thing. Uh, because I've changed as a person, my environment has changed. Um, you know, and this might open up a whole new world to me, which I was previously completely oblivious to or completely um, ignorant of. You know? mm -hmm. So I think career redevelopment means just taking that risk, being courageous, not worrying about failing and realizing that you know, it's OK to fail. You're going to you know, ultimately succeed. But it's, oh, it's a part of that personal growth, growing as a person, to step out and redevelop your career. And as, as John and Annie and were mentioning, you know, we see a lot of students at community colleges now coming back after getting their bachelor's degree and master, or master's degree and coming back and getting their associate's degree in a career that they <clears throat> previously were you know, never thinking that they would, they would take on. Um, w one example is the cybersecurity program that we're working on with Anne Arundel Community College in Maryland. Right? So there's a mixture of students there. There's some 17 and 18 year olds who are just like, you know, we love cybersecurity, we love IT, and this is what we're going to do. But then there's some. 40-year-olds in there is actually a 50, I believe some a lady in her 50s who was there as well for this pilot test that I was conducting there. And she was telling me, like, you know, not in a million years could I have thought that I'm going to be an entry-level cybersecurity technician, but here I am, you know, taking this class, and I'm loving it, you know. And But it's 
completely transformed my life and completely transformed what I think of myself and the world around me. Mm -hmm. And I was just so inspired by that because mm -hmm. I was just thinking, like, how cool is that, that yeah. this lady in her 50s, who would have never in a million years thought that she's going to be like a cybersecurity technician, is now kind of living this dream that she knew she never had. All right. you know? So I want to challenge what you just said a little bit. <clears throat> Getting out of your comfort zone, which I think is an amazing thing, is also one of the hardest things to do. Yeah. As a human being, you want to naturally be in a place of comfort in a place that you're stable and you're confident in. So let's say the environment changes. 2008, the financial recession was a good example. And that forced us, forced many of us, to get out of our comfort zone. How does re career redevelopment tie into events like that, John? So, you know, I, I, I think there is something about getting out of your comfort zone. I think there's also something about uh, looking at your, your asset inventory and trying to figure out what you can leverage in different ways. Uh, I do a lot of informational interviews with folks who are looking to change careers, sometimes looking to move from uh, the for-profit sector to the non-profit sector. And my advice always is, you know, think about what, what, what skills, abilities, and interests you, are, you, you have and figure out how you can leverage that in the next thing. Um, so I remember speaking to uh, an attorney who was a litigator, and he was just tired of the confrontation of litigation and wanted to do something different. Uh, and he wanted to work in the, in the nonprofit sector. And so we talked a little bit about that and talked about, you know, would he, might he be interested in working for a legal advocacy organization? He has some legal experience. Uh, maybe he could put that to work for a civil rights organization. Or maybe he's uh, he's got this real ability to take a lot of information that's part of a civil lit litigation case and sort of organize it and manage it. Maybe he really wants to go into sort of an information management career. Um, and so we, we, we really talked uh, over the course of our, of our informational interview about how you take some of his experience and some of his background and interests and really think about how that might be leveraged for the next thing for himself. Right. Annie, your thoughts? I, I was just going to say in terms of sort of um, unexpected events, I mean, I, I think as humans we're pretty wildly naive and we sort of plan for all the good things, but right. we, don't, we don't plan for illnesses <coughs> and divorces and accidents and all the sorts of things that happen. And I don't think we can um, really go against our nature, but I think we can, um, as we're developing our career and redeveloping our career, make sure that we're looking at those sort of playing out those what-if scenarios a little bit. You know, what if I lost my job? next week? What if I didn't have my partner's income anymore? What, you know, thinking about some of those things and playing them out and if, um, in our minds and if those end in situations that would be pretty dire, then mm -hmm. making sure that we're, we're developing in a way to, um, to account for those a little bit mm -hmm. um, and making sure, that, to John's point, that we're developing our skills and ourselves um, in addition to this, um, the specific skills for a certain job so that if something does happen, you can take those skills and jump into another career, maybe a, a whole other field or just a different firm across the street. All right, so let's talk about skills, tangible skills. What are the correct reasons to go back to school after you've already been working for five to ten years? Um, for some, it might be just part of their career strategy. They already intended to do it. But for many others, you had mentioned the 50-year-old woman who's in cybersecurity, um, which I love, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the right reasons? Well, what should people be thinking about when they think about going back for another certification or a master's or something even higher? I feel like it should be an extension of something that you're already doing and you already like to do, or mm -hmm. at least in the same genre. I, I think I come across a lot of people that are sort of unhappy in the job they're in, so then they start thinking about going back to school. Right. Um, and so maybe it's just the job that you're unhappy in. So maybe you need another job instead of going back to school. And so I think. Um, the reasons that you would want to go back and invest, quite frankly, your time and your money and your energy in something new is um, if you've tried it out, maybe you've done some inf informational interviews with people, you've shadowed some folks, you've done an internship or a volunteer opportunity in addition to what you're doing, and you really realize that's something that you want to do. So you're not running from something you don't like, but you're, you're going towards something that you really yeah. already love and enjoy. I see you nodding your head, John. What are the steps that one would need to take to get to that? So, and actually, if I can just, Please, just, just to back up just a second, <coughs> I, I actually think, uh, particularly if you're, you're going into a long-term program or mm -hmm. maybe with an expensive school, mm -hmm. uh, you really want to have a sense of where you're headed to. And I, I remember when I was uh, getting my uh, MBA, uh, with folks who didn't really know what they were doing and knowing that it was costing, you know, tens of thousands of dollars plus, you know, taking yourself out of the workforce for two years, really, this, uh, that, that seemed to me a very, very expensive uh, sort of career Hello. exploration <laughs> yeah, moment. Um, but on the other hand, you think about a community college and taking a class or two right. to explore a particular area of interest that maybe you're interested in. I think it gets to this idea of being able to try something out. 
Uh, so take a night class and just mm -hmm. sort of see, do you, right. you, does the topic interest you? Uh, and so I think, I think there are times when you can use going back to school as an exploration moment. There are times when you really want to use that as an opportunity to build uh, towards a particular objective. Uh, and then I think there are times, you know, to your point, where uh, there's a little bit of defensiveness, where you're thinking, oh, I see these other skills sort of starting to come up uh, in, the, in, in my company, and they seem to be valued, and I want to try and hedge off the possibility of being laid off, or maybe if I do get laid off, I want to be sure I have this credential that I can take out uh, into the market. It might be worth sort of getting a sort of short-term credential for that uh, purpose. Um, so I think, uh, you know, my own sense is that there are many different reasons to go back to school, and you should just be clear that the program and the cost of the program are, uh, are commensurate with, with the objective you're trying to get to. So, so speaking to the cost, and in some cases it can be quite hefty, uh, Rishi, there's obviously going to be two goals when one goes back to school. There's going to be an academic goal and, of course, a professional goal. It's typically, in most cases, the professional goal is what led, but what, what are the differences between those two goals, and if there are any, um, how should a student manage those? Sure. Well, I think one thing that Annie brought up is really important is that, you know, when you're evaluating whether it's time to go back to school or not, you know, sometimes you don't want to make a hasty decision, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to step back and say, well, I might not be liking this job, or some, as John was mentioning, I might have a boss that I don't like, but that doesn't mean like it's time for a career change. Right. So sometimes you just have to um, give it a while, and that's where I think career development comes in, where you have to give it some time and try mm -hmm. it out and and stick with it for a little while to really make that determine whether it's the right timing for you or not. Um, I think in some instances it's it's clear where you know if, the, if it's um, an economic reason or the, the economy is changing, you lost your job and you see no job prospects, it's a, it's a dying industry, then it's kind of obvious, right? Then you make a rational choice. But where the personal side comes in, which you just brought up, I think that's where it's all not as, it's black and white and there's much more of a gray area, which is why I think you kind of need to take your time with it and not make a hasty decision. Um, but at the same time, once you have taken your time with it and you have exhausted all the options that are out there to try to develop that one career, but it's just not working out, then I think it makes sense for you to think, well, well, then maybe it is time for me to go back to school. Maybe it is time for me to pursue this entirely new line. But what I would advise is just just don't don't let every little thing you know get to you and, and then think about, well, it's time for a career change. Because then at the end of the day, you'll really end up with no career that you'll like over the long term. You have to give it some time, in my opinion. And, and I, my, my suspicion is we've all hired at one point or another and seen the resume where somebody has jumped from job to job, right. you know, after nine or months or a year. And th that's a, that, sometimes there's a good story behind that, but oftentimes that's sort of off-putting to a prospective employer. Right. And as I always say, there's no more Derek Jeters in the world of corporate America, but you don't want to be a Ricky Henderson either. So um, you're all highly accomplished, highly uh, educated individuals. And Rishi, we had the privilege of hearing your story in, in, in part one of our series. Annie, what type of career development and or redevelopment have you gone through? Well, I, I feel like the question might be the lack of, you know, I mean, very early on, I was sort of the um, undecided going into college, and I think it was early on in my junior year that I uh, had a frantic call with my mom and said, I'm out of all the general electives, I have to choose a major now, and <laughs> sort of didn't know what I wanted to do. I loved lots of different classes, and I remember <coughs> her saying, um, just pick what you love the most, and then you, you can, you'll figure things out as you, as you go on. So I ended up picking um, what my favorite classes were at the time, and I got a psychology degree and a women's studies minor, and really enjoyed it, and enjoyed the, the, my final um, couple of years. And really, that was sort of a, a building block for me. And so I, after that, um, came out and didn't really know what I was going to do with my psychology degree. You know, I couldn't really be, practice psychology. You know, and so um, I, I, I floundered a little bit, and I worked. I, you know, reality set in. I had to pay the bills, so I um, worked for a couple of years and found some things that I knew I didn't want to do, um, which is often, I think, what happens. Um, was that experience valuable? It was absolutely valuable, and I think sometimes you have to have the jobs that you you don't. Um, like as much or aren't for you so that you can learn who you are and what you really do like. Right. Um, and, and so I don't think that any of that time was wasted. And I think people watching this or, or, or may be in that situation, especially when you first come out and you don't know what you want to do, you're entry level. Um, you're not um, doing what the people far advanced in your field are doing, which can sometimes be the most exciting. Um, so I did that for a few years and then started to really, I, I felt like I had given it some time and started to look in, okay, what field do I really want to be in? You know, I had been in business where the, really the only metric for success was how much money you make, and right. that just wasn't enough. I needed more in terms of giving back to the community, um, you know, community service. I, I sort of blame that on my parents, because um, that, that's how I was raised. And so um, 
I really wanted more of that and ended up kind of going back and exploring public health and, and then went back for a, a graduate degree in public health and then did a, you know, did a fellowship at, at CDC in Atlanta. And, and so, uh, but a lot of other things factored in, you know, I got married in there, family, we moved, you know, lots of different things. And so I don't feel like any of the time um, was, was wasted. It was all very valuable, um, but I've always been sort of a, um, you know, needing to change things often. And so I think what I would do um, when I was younger was change jobs. Um, I was probably one of those people every year or year and a half was changing jobs. But what I've realized now is that I just need to have a position in a professional um, role where I can work on a lot of different projects mm -hmm. within my role. And so those are all at different, um, at, at different places at different times. They're all focused on different things. So that holds my interest, but I don't have to leave the job or leave the field. That's great. Thank you for that perspective. John, yeah. what career development or redevelopment got you to the Aspen Institute? You know, I, uh, I, I actually... Um, uh, have been in the social sector, the nonprofit sector my whole life. Uh, one way or another, I've been um, working on economic opportunity for disadvantaged people. Uh, and I've loved that work, and it's been great. And at one point, uh, I had the privilege uh, to take a job with the Ford Foundation and do that work. Uh, and I was a grant maker. I was giving out money. One of the best jobs in the world, <laughs> I can tell you, uh, is to give away money uh, and um, uh, in, a, in an area that I loved. Uh, and I actually had a, a, a remarkable opportunity at the Ford Foundation to really think about uh, not only how I gave away money, but how does the institution give away money. Sure. I got a management job there to sort of help design the systems and grow the capacity of the Ford Foundation to have higher levels of impact in the field. Really love that. Um, but at the end of the day, I realized I really needed to get back to the substance of that work, uh, to uh, actually uh, touching people who are in school, working with employers who are trying to hire people from school. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's where I decided it was time for me to leave uh, my position at the, at the Ford Foundation and come back uh, to the Aspen, come back to the field and do work at the Aspen Institute. And take a minute to talk about the Aspen Institute. So uh, the Aspen Institute's a think tank in Washington, D.C. Uh, it is uh, really uh, conscious of the power of bringing together different constituencies and people from across different political parties to try and solve the problems of the country. Uh, we work uh, with Democrats and Republicans in a nonpartisan way. Uh, we work on uh, multiple of issues that requires uh, business leaders, educational leaders, civic leaders, community leaders, uh, people who are experts at, in the practice of what they do uh, to really craft, and so, craft solutions to the world's problems. My area of the Institute really focuses on expanding economic opportunity for disadvantaged people. And in particular, we really look at what does it take uh, to bring uh, educational institutions and workforce development institutions in closer partnership with employers to solve the problems of, uh, of the skills that employers need and to expand economic opportunity for workers and for job seekers. Excellent. Well, I think there's one theme that we took away from today's topic. It was that it's okay to take risks and it's okay to fail. And I think if our current working force can realize that, we might see some great ideas come out in the next quarter century. So Annie, John, Rishi, thank you so much for the time. Great to be here. Thank you. On that note, that'll wrap up our show for today. If you like what you saw in today's episode, please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you have any comments or questions for myself, don't hesitate to reach out via email or Twitter. And if you'd like to keep up with the ongoings of State of Mind, please check out our website at www.bmcc.cuny.edu slash state of mind. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. And remember, every life is a book. Make yours a bestseller. Have a good night. <laughs>